Mr. Tumnus. Of all the creatures in Narnia, there may be none more beloved than the kind and timid fawn who wears only an iconic red scarf and carries a black umbrella. For many people, Mr. Tumnus is the quintessential representation of Narnia, a land filled with magic, myths, and kind-hearted talking creatures. But Mr. Tumnus is much more than a simple two-dimensional character. And as we'll see, he's actually a rather complex figure with a complicated past and a compelling future. There's much to learn about Tumnus, but even more to learn from Tumnus. So let's get started. It's time to leave the Shadowlands behind and step into a world that's more real than our own. It's time to follow me into the wardrobe. Tumnus was a fawn who lived during the time of the long winter, as well as throughout the entire golden age of Narnia. He was the very first Narnian we ever read about introduced to our world in the 1950 publication of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And what a dramatic meeting it was. Lucy had just stepped through the wardrobe into the woods on the western edge of Narnia. And in the light of a lone lamppost, there walked a fawn, carrying bundles of parcels in one arm and an umbrella in the other. What many people may not know is that this simple scene was the first image in the mind of C.S. Lewis that would serve as the seed for the entire world of Narnia. C.S. Lewis first imagined this scene when he was only a teenager. He described this inspiration in his own words, saying, The lion all began with a picture of a fawn carrying an umbrella and parcels in a snowy wood. This picture had been in my mind since I was about 16. Then one day, when I was about 40, I said to myself, Let's try to make a story about it. And so, it could be said that thanks to this single fawn, the entire world was given the gift of Narnia. But who exactly is Tumnus? What does he mean to the world of Narnia? Is there more than Tumnus than meets the eye? Well, maybe the first thing to ask is, what exactly is a fawn? Fawns are an ancient Roman mythological creature which is described as having the upper body of a man with the ears and horns and legs of a goat. They're creatures of the untamed woodlands, which explains why Mr. Tumnus was walking alone in the far edges of Narnia in the wild woods to the west. Now, over the last century, people have begun to incorrectly describe fawns as the equivalent of the Greek satyrs. However, they're very different creatures. Satyrs had human-like legs and weren't generally hairy like fawns. Satyrs were also much more mischievous and licentious than fawns, and were known for their unrelenting pursuit of creatures of the female persuasion. Fawns, on the other hand, are more benign and jovial. They're known for their merrymaking and festivities, dancing, telling jokes, eating delicious foods, and most famously, making music with their magical pipes. They're also notoriously charming and likable to the point that wicked fawns were fabled to sometimes use charm to lure their unsuspecting victims into the deep woods in order to rob them. And like many of his fellow fawns, Mr. Tumnus was not as pure of heart as he seemed. Of course, Mr. Tumnus was warm and inviting. He brought Lucy into his cozy den and served her delicious foods and teas. But all of his charm and hospitality was just a facade. From the moment Tumnus met Lucy, He'd been deceiving her, manipulating her. Even the readers are fooled by Tumnus's charm into liking him, even trusting him. The truth is, Tumnus was under the employ of the White Witch as a spy and an informant, and he had standing orders that if he ever met any humans, he was to bring them to the witch, eventually to be killed. Of course, given some of the books that he read, such as Is Man a Myth? Tumnus may have believed that he would never really meet an actual human, Still, the truth remains, Tumnus cunningly executed his plan to bring this young human girl to his den to lure her to sleep with his magical flute with the intention of handing her over to death. Make no mistake, Tumnus had aligned himself with the dark forces of the false queen of Narnia, and he was certainly no friend of Aslan. But Tumnus's story doesn't end there. Perhaps if we had known the origins of his name, we wouldn't be surprised that change was coming. There are several theories about the basis of Tumnus' unusual name, but the most convincing is that it's a nod to Vertumnus, the Roman god of growth, seasons, and change. Of course, the meeting of Lucy and Tumnus marked the beginning of big changes in Narnia, the first change in seasons in almost 100 years. 
But perhaps the most remarkable change would be seen in Tumnus' own life. And though we can't be sure of the exact reason for this change, perhaps it was the picture of his noble father above the fireplace. Perhaps it was the innocence of the lullaby melody. Maybe it was the realization that the Golden Age prophecy was at hand. All we know is that as Tumnus stood on a razor's edge of right and wrong, good and evil, Tumnus changed alliances and fell on the side of Aslan. Through tears, he confessed his plan to kidnap Lucy and instead helped her escape to safety. And Tumnus knew in that moment he had transformed from an enemy of Aslan to a martyr for Narnia. But now there was a new Tumnus, one that said he would do what was right regardless of the consequences, even though it most certainly meant he would be turned to stone by the White Witch's magic. And he was right. But for the new Tumnus, the courageous Tumnus, there could be no other way. But again, Tumnus's story doesn't end there. For with nothing but his kingly breath, Aslan revived all who had given their lives in defiance of the queen, releasing them from their petrified curse within a matter of moments. And when Tumnus and the others were revived, they were given another dose of boldness. This time, they wouldn't just resist, they would fight. And at the first battle of Baruna, they joined with their fellow Narnians, fighting the evil forces of the tyrant Jadis, fighting the very forces Tumnus had once been a part of himself. And before the sun set that day, the witch was dead, and the thrones of Narnia were restored to the sons of Adam and the daughters of Eve. But Tumnus' story doesn't end there. For years later, threaded among the stories about a horse and his boy, we catch a glimpse of Tumnus once again, this time in the faraway city of Tashben. He's now known as Master Tumnus, and he's no longer a young adult fawn, but is very much nearing middle age. Over the years though, he's grown in wisdom and he's now a member of a diplomatic delegation who's been sent to oversee a very uneasy situation in a very dangerous country of Calamon. And much like the days long ago when he helped a young future queen escape a deadly tyrant, Tumnus has now planned another daring escape from a tyrannical ruler, as he helps Queen Susan this time and the rest of the Narnian party escape the Calamine Prince Rabadash. If it wasn't for Tumnus's cunning plan to secretly escape on the ship, the Splendor Highland, Queen Susan may have been forced to marry Rabadash. And so we see Tumnus had transformed from a life many years ago as a secret informant in service of a false queen to now a trusted advisor in service of a true queen. But Tumnus's story doesn't end there. For though Tumnus would pass away some years later, we see him one final time as he and Lucy joyfully reunite just past the Golden Gates in Aslan's garden. It's fitting that the story of Narnia ends the same way it began, with a young girl named Lucy meeting a fawn named Tumnus just past the entrance to a world more real than the one they left behind. For a fawn whose very name speaks of seasons, growth, and change, Tumnus certainly lived a life that rang true to his title. For Tumnus, change and growth didn't just happen on its own, it happened as the result of a life dedicated to the service of Aslan and his kingdom. And that's the way it should be for all of us. Because none of us are who we should be, and none of us are where we want to be. But if our lives are dedicated to a more noble cause, in service of a true and great kingdom, then we too can look back on a life that, season after season, has changed us, grown us, transformed us into becoming the person we were truly destined to be. Well, that's all the time we have for today. If you've been inspired by the transformation of Tumnus, leave a comment below and tell us about it. Next week, we'll be taking a rather unusual journey into the wardrobe, so don't forget to subscribe so you won't miss it. And be sure to join us next time as we take another journey into the wardrobe.